Good morning, men. How are you all today? You guys hear me all right? Okay. Well, let me tell you uh, about my past 72 hours. I woke up on Monday feeling pretty great. I had a full schedule as usual, lots of very important things to do. And then my lips started to hurt a little bit. By Tuesday uh, evening, it was like down to my belly. This thing was huge. And uh, so I'm over here worried because the most important thing I had was is this talk. You know, I really wanted to come and, and do this. So I was, you know, pretty, pretty frustrated by that. My wife looked at me and she said, all right, well, be a man. You'll be fine. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so sometimes the, the wives are good at reminding you that you're to be the man. And, um, but I went to the doctors. I, I got some steroids to bring that inflammation down. And, and we did it. And, and it's feeling pretty good now. And my lip looks pretty much back to normal. But I think that my major point here is when you put yourself out there uh, for God and you do it publicly, it seems that a lot of times you get attacks and a lot of times you get attacks from fellow believers. Believe me, I I am dealing with that now sometimes saying I talk about God too much when I'm talking about uh, me running for office. But uh, it's not just those kind of attacks, but it's also something else in another dimension. I feel that often we're attacked and, and I just can't help but to think and feel that that was one of those such things that the enemy tried to stop me from speaking tonight, but apparently he's got bad aim. He missed my tongue by two inches. <laughs> so, so here we are. But I'd like to start with a word of prayer. And I, and I want to I talk about prayer just for a moment. Uh, sometimes I feel that we, we go to prayer and, and we don't really remember what we're doing. All of us are guilty of it, especially in public. We, sometimes we find ourselves talking to the people in the room. But really, prayer is communication with the Lord. That is communication with God the Father. So it's a solemn, serious thing. We must go to prayer with very sincere hearts and remember what we're doing when we do it. So if you wouldn't mind to bow your head with that in mind as I lead us in prayer. Dear Father, we come to you today with humility. Father, you see the men in this room there. They're ready to receive your word. They want your presence. We ask for your presence through the Holy Spirit, Lord. This morning we want a double dosing of that presence. We want you to guide us all. We know what you can do. We know who you are. We've we've read the testimonies in the book. We felt it in our hearts. We accepted your son. So please, Lord, be with us today in this moment. Guide us here. Anything I have planned to say, Lord, if it's not yours, throw it away. Guide me. Guide my words. I pray this in the name of your powerful son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Okay, so today I am mostly going to read from the ESV. We're going to go through a lot of good scripture. Uh, But this first scripture I want to read, I'm going to read it in the the King James. So I'll ask for a little grace as the ESV is really the Iron Man uh, preferred. But uh, as some of you may feel the same way, there's certain translations that just really speak to you, especially with certain verses. And this particular piece that I'm going to read, this particular part of the Bible that I'm going to read, I learned it in the, in the King James Version. I grew up hearing it that way, and actually my brother and I, as adults, memorized this whole portion, and, and you'll see what it is in a moment. But um, it was through the King James. And I, I, I think that for me, it's the King James Version is... It, kind of feels like God's vernacular, you know? Uh, of course, that's ridiculous. It's not. But it's just us as humans. Sometimes we get that sort of emotional attachments to certain things, even if they be silly. Uh, so if what we'll do is I'm going to read a lot of scripture today. So we won't stand for it every single time. But for this first one, we will do the new Ironman tradition. Thanks to Chris. Where's Chris? That new Ironman tradition that Chris started maybe about a year ago now. So if you wouldn't mind standing with me as we read this first piece of scripture. And listen, boys, you're lucky I'm not making you get on a knee because it's kind of long. All right. So what I'm going to read here is Exodus 20. And I know at least Bishop already knows what I'm going to read. But if if you'll come to me to the word here, and I will read this. And God spake all these words, saying, I am the Lord thy God, which have brought thee out of the land of Egypt out of the house of bondage. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven images or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above 
or that is in the earth beneath, or that is in the water under the earth. Thou shalt not bow down thyself to them, nor serve them. For I, the Lord thy God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquities of the fathers upon the children and to the third and fourth generation of them that hate me, and showing mercy unto thousands of them that love me and keep my commandments. Thou shalt not take it the name of the Lord thy God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless who taketh thy name in vain. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days thou shalt labor and do all thy work, but the seventh is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. In it thou shalt do no work, thou, nor thy son, nor thy daughter, nor thy manservant, nor thy maidservant, nor thy cattle, nor thy stranger within thy gates. For in six days the Lord made the heaven, the earth, the sea, and all that in them is, and rested the seventh day. Wherefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. Honor thy father and thy mother, that their days may be long upon the land of which the Lord thy God giveth thee. Thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not bear false witness against thy neighbor, thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's house, thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's wife, nor his manservant, nor his maidservant, nor his ox, nor his ass, nor anything that is thy neighbor's. And all the people saw the thunderings and the lightning and the noise from the trumpet and the mountain smoking. And when the people saw it, they removed and stood afar off. Thank you. You may be seated. <clears throat> the Ten Commandments are often still revered by Christians, but a lot of times what happens, I believe, that we hear the very accurate, the most true phrase ever in existence, grace alone, by faith alone. But does that mean all of the laws are to be thrown away and disregarded? Of course not, and I don't think anybody really believes that. For one thing, how can you know the blessings of God in your salvation? How can you realize the power of your salvation if you don't know how far off you are? And that's why it's so important to revere the law. When Jesus came, uh, he said many things about the law, and we're going to go through them in a moment. And I think that what's the, really the point is when he said these things, what are we to do with the law now? How are we to act as Christians with the law? So what I'm going to do right now is we're going to go to uh, the words of Christ himself. And we're going to go to Matthew. Matthew 5.17 in the ESV. And in Matthew 5.17, Christ says, this is just after the Beatitudes, do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. For truly I say unto you, until heaven and earth passes, not an iota, not a dot, will pass from the law until all is accomplished. Therefore, whoever relaxes one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever does them and teaches them will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I tell you, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and the Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Now I want to pause on that last part right there, because it might be a little confusing. Matthew 20, 520. That's what I see Christ, I see him being a little bit sarcastic. And the way I, reason I say that is because we know that the scribes and the Pharisees, according to Matthew's book itself, just a few pages back, that they're a brood of vipers. And so how can it be that Jesus says to us, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and the Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. His point here is that it's, just, it's not about the way they act. And the way they acted is the scribes and Pharisees were very good at making loud prayers in the synagogue. They were very good at being pious publicly. But when they went home and when their intentions were revealed, when they dealt with others, when they dealt with Christ, we saw their true nature. And that is really the point. How are we acting? We might be doing the right things publicly. I might go on my Facebook page and say something really cool about God. But then I go home and I disrespect my wife. 
and I treat her with impatience. I do that. Those are my worst moments in life. So we have to check ourselves because we are a fallen creature and we have to put that in check. You know, I want to tell a story about my brother and I. When we moved to Orange County about 15 years ago from Miami, uh, so you know, we're Florida boys, but Miami is kind of called North Cuba down there. And, uh, and so we moved to Orange County and we were very excited in our early 20s. And um, we were working out at the gym, some gym in Orlando, I think like Shaq owned it or something cool. And so I thought of a new idea, a special idea, because I always believed in Christ. I grew up in a church, with my grandparents particularly, uh, in an old Methodist church. And I always loved the Lord, but I didn't always walk with the Lord. And I think all of you men know what I mean by that. Uh, but I always did love the Lord. And, and so I said to Xander, I said, look, why don't we, we need to make a declaration of faith. After workout, every day we're going to go in that locker room. And we're going to get on our knees, boy, and we're going to pray. We're going to do it in front of everybody. So we did that, and I thought it was awesome. I thought we were really glorifying God. And then I went to my father uh, on Thanksgiving that year. Going to report to him, tell him how amazing I am. <laughs> and my father uh, was a wise man. He was a, a strong man, but a good man. And he, and he really loved the Lord, and he understood. I always felt that he had a very strong connection. And so when I told him this, what we were doing, son, <laughs> that's real nice. That's real nice. But what you need to understand is that the only prayer that really, really counts is when you go in your closet and you do it alone and you never tell anybody else about it. You know, it's one thing to make a show. And if you want to do that, go ahead. But make sure you're really praying. And that's what the Pharisees were doing. And that's what Christ was referring to. You could be the most pious person in the room in terms of outward appearances. But are you really earning your keep in the kingdom of God? So let's go back. Matthew, back to 5.17. Do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. You see, the fundamental, the foundational laws of morality, particularly with the Ten Commandments, they are still critical today. Christ has said so. But it is the sacrificial and ritualistic laws that have been fulfilled by Christ those have been fulfilled. What we must realize is that Christ was the final lamb. Christ is a very important thing because God did to himself what he wouldn't do to Abraham. What he wouldn't do to Abraham, God did to himself. He told Abraham, go up there, I'll get you a sacrifice, bring that boy. When you get up there, I'll tell you what's going to happen. Sacrifice the boy. Abraham has faith. He knows he's actually talking to God. And he reaches up his arm. God stops him. There's your lamb. Sacrifice the lamb to me. God wouldn't do it to Abraham, but God did it to himself. God sacrificed his only son. There is no more need for sacrifices. It has been completed. So when we look at that, when we look at the lamb that has been slain, we know that the lamb is worthy. Worthy is the lamb, Revelations 5.12. So should we follow the law? Does that require us to follow the law? Let's look at that law. One, no other gods. There's only one true God. Seems pretty good. That's the first commandment. No graven images. You can't be building that golden calf. You remember what happened. Moses came down, 10 commandments, comes back. They have a golden calf. They're worshiping. He has to go up and get it again. Number three, no use of his name in vain. You cannot do immoral things, invoke God's name. That's what that means. And we see plenty of examples of that in this world. Respect the Sabbath. It's very important, I believe, to find the time to set aside with family and God. Respect your parents, so critical, so lost on so many. That doesn't mean you have to believe that everything that they have said and done is right. Some parents have done horrible things even to their children but you need to respect them. No murder, no adultery, no stealing, no false witness, that's lying, no lying, and no coveting others. Yes, these are foundational laws of morality, but no, our salvation is not dependent on them. And I know that um, 
Brother David is probably wondering if I forgot what I'm supposed to speak about today. <laughs> we are speaking about Paul and how God empowers men to follow Christ. The reality is, is that this was the truth, that we are saved by grace alone, but through and by Christ. But many did not receive it properly in the early church, in Paul's time. In the early church, there was conflict about who could be saved and which laws should be followed. This is a critical part of Paul's story. If you go to Galatians 2.11, we will see something pretty profound. In this passage, Paul confronts Peter as he sees that he's finally, Peter's finally accepting Gentiles into his inner circle. Because remember, originally it was the Israelites. You had to be one of the Jewish people to be part of the faith, even the way, even the way of Christ. But Paul, who was originally Saul, the killer of Christians, who was converted by Christ himself, Paul said, no, it's for the Gentiles too. He received this from the Lord. Peter had a rough time with that. So Peter comes into, a, well, Paul comes into a situation where he busts through the door and he sees that Peter is there eating with, with Gentiles, non-Jews. This is a wonderful thing. But when a bunch of uh, circumcised Hebrews come in, then he changes his attitude. Peter did. And he pretends like he wasn't doing that. He was ashamed of what was the gospel of Jesus Christ, the true gospel, that it's all for the Gentiles as well. So in Galatians 2.11, that's where we come in. And Peter describes it. But when Peter came to Antioch, I opposed him to his face because he stood condemned. Do you see the boldness of Paul? This is Peter. This is the rock. Christ said, you are the rock to which I will build my church. And here you have Paul. Wasn't even born when Christ was walking the earth in the flesh. Paul's coming in here telling him, you're condemned for this. You need to accept these men fully, not just in your prayer closet. You have the opposite. Now you need to do it in the public. And so that is the boldness of Paul, accepting Gentiles behind closed doors, but not in front of others, was Peter condemning himself. But what about us? Do we stand like Paul today? Do we truly do that? When we see filthy content on the screens constantly, you pull up Facebook or other social media, there's nothing but titillation for men to distract their minds and corrupt their hearts. Do we stand against it? Do we speak against it? When the school boards are doing things that are totally immoral, are we acting on it? When our pop culture mocks men constantly, and if you look at it in pop culture, men, and this has been going on for decades, and we've said nothing. The father is always this goofy guy that doesn't have any of the wisdom. It's always, it's not even the wife that has the wisdom, it's the children. And maybe if he's a good man even in the show, he's, he's going to be the silly man that has to learn some lesson from his children. Well, that's not biblical, and that's devaluing men in our culture. And it's been going on for a long, long time, and that's why we're in the mess we're in. So I think that we can go now to, uh, back to the Old Testament is what I'd like to do because a lot of people say that God is the same today as he was yesterday. I believe that. But I think what a lot of the feel-good preachers say, the feel-good preachers, what they mean is that God's not going to judge you at all. He's not going to think twice about you. Everything's okay. Do what you want. And that's not so. That's not biblical. That's not biblical on this side of this book, and that's not biblical on this side of this book. That's fiction. God does care about your actions. I want to go to Amos, something that I have really has been spoken to me for, for years, actually. Uh, and I, I often put it on audio and fall asleep to it. It's kind of dark. I don't know why I like it so much. But... Um, <laughs> And I, and I worried about that, too. I'm like, man, I was prepping last night late. And I'm like, oh, this is a whole, like, I feel like I'm going to be doing this. I feel like I'm going to bring everybody down, but I think this is important. We get enough of the feel-good stuff. In Amos 7, now Amos was one of the lesser prophets. 
This is when Israel was split to the north and the southern kingdoms. And Amos was just a worker guy. He wasn't anything, you know, he wasn't like a Pharisee or anything like that. Nothing like that at all. But God spoke to him and called him to be a prophet. And he was in the south and he went to the north. The north was becoming corrupt by a corrupt king. And what was the corruption? The root of the corruption was money. You see, it's not that money is evil. It's the worship of money. It's the love and obsession of money. And that is all too what happens, that, that happens all too often, even to this day, even though we're constantly warned about it. So that's what hap- was happening in Israel at the time in the northern kingdom. They had a corrupt king, so Amos was speaking against that, speaking to the nations surrounding that as well. And God came to him, came to him with this vision where he saw God in Amos 7, 7, 7. Amos speaks, he says, Thus he showed me, and behold, the Lord stood upon a wall made by a plumb line. Now a plumb line, for those of you manly men who are more manly than me, probably already know what that is. I learned from the Bible. It's this big rope you put on, you put uh, this plumb bob on a rope and and a string and you put it there and on the end of it, it'll hold the weight in this beautiful thing called gravity that was invented by God, uh, holds it down and pulls that string so perfectly straight so that you know that that's a straight line. So when you're building walls, particularly, I mean, we have other methods now, but particularly in the ancient times they had this, the plumb line would be to make sure that your walls are straight, that they're upright. So you would test it by the plumb line. You'd put the plumb line in your hand and you'd drop it and you'd wait till it gets still and you'd judge that wall. Is this upright? Thus he showed me, and behold, the Lord stood on a wall made by a plumb line with a plumb line in his hand. And the Lord said unto me, Amos, what seest thou? And I said, a plumb line. Then said the Lord, behold, I will set a plumb line in the midst of my people Israel. I will spare them no more. We must realize that God has standards. He's the same today as he was yesterday. He's the same today as he was yesterday. He's not a silly God. He's not these men that you see on the sitcoms where we're going to teach him something. No, we're his children. We need to obey his laws. He's not a pushover. And the other thing is, I think that a lot of times we fool ourselves as as Christians, meaningful, meaning well. And I know I've done it many times. We say, oh, saved through grace alone. Again, so true. Nothing else can be more true. That is the most pivotal thing that has ever been relayed to mankind is this gospel, the good news. But it's not a hall pass. You don't get a hall pass to do whatever you want in this world and live in filth and sin and think that you're going to be okay. You're not going to be okay. You have to realize that there is no hall pass. You have to act out your faith. So what do we do? Well, one thing I think is is terribly true is one of the worst things that have ever has ever happened to our culture is we were taught decades ago not to talk about, I know a lot of you won't think I'm right on this one, but let me tell you, not to talk about religion and politics and company. That is wrong. It's totally wrong. Religion and politics. So we're not to talk about our faith and company? What about the Great Commission? What happened? The Great Commission doesn't matter. Some progressive fool that came up with that phrase 100 years ago, he's better than Christ, he knows better. We were told to go out and spread the gospel of Jesus Christ. You must talk about your faith to others. You must do it in the workplace. You must do it at Thanksgiving. You must do it when you're in line at the post office. That is not an option. That is part of receiving your salvation. We must follow the Great Commission. So don't listen to those who have tried to take us away from the faith for years and years by teaching us not to talk about our faith in good company, in politics. Well, ultimately, politics is what can really stop you from talking about your faith, isn't it? That's the founding of this country. In other places in Europe, we weren't really allowed to worship the way we wanted to. So we moved to America, the new land, and we were able to talk about our faith. Politics crept in. It's weird, every year, less and less are you allowed to talk about your faith in politics. 
as I mentioned, I'm running for office. I put my Christianity on my sleeve. I talk about it all the time. And even good... And even good, well-meaning Christians. Austin, you got to cool it with the Jesus stuff. <laughs> no. <laughs> Sorry. This is why we live. This is why I live. I live for Christ and Christ alone. All the other things are just facets that are necessary, a necessary part of this journey. But this is not our home, man. This is not our home. We are here for a very, very short time. And we've been given a commission. So talk about politics. Talk about your faith. Because politics, you know how Paul died? Well, essentially, it's politics. Paul, the, the subject that we're talking about, he didn't die of old age. Politics forced him. The leaders killed him. That's how Paul died. So we must protect our right to have our faith, or one day we will wake up in a political environment where you can't talk about your faith unless it be from a jail cell. Are you really ready to go to jail for the word of God? I believe I am, but I'm a weak man. I don't want the test. It's easier for me now to talk about politics, to talk about my faith. I believe that I, I would die for Christ. I know that I will. I know it in my heart, but my flesh is so weak. So I think that the truth is when people say that, I think the message is really what we should all agree with is don't argue about politics. Don't get in these silly, nasty debates with people. Meet them where they are. The enemy is chipping away at our culture every day, little by little, little by little. Starts with a little joke on a sitcom. Dads are dumb, men are stupid. And then it goes further. Now your child's confused about what gender they are. It's a chip, it goes a chip away and away. Well, we do the same thing, that's what we need to do. We need to chip away. Don't come bombastic on people. Don't go to Thanksgiving now. Austin fired me up. He said that you're a bum, dumb person and you need to vote for Trump and you need to... No, no, no. Believe me, I'm not saying that. What I am saying is that you come with humility. Come Christ-like with these folks. When they disagree, when they don't know the word, give them the gospel. That's easy for us. We know that here in this group. This group knows that. But with politics, we need to influence as well. We need to do it gently. So don't get in arguments with people. Well, there's um, something else I want to talk about, and that's with regard, and, and of course we're talking about standing up in the faith, allowing God to do that, just like Paul. Paul talked about the faith. Paul talked about politics. He pushed back. C.S. Lewis uh, said something very profound that I've, has spoken to me for a very long time, and I want to read it to you. And it says, quote, God will invade. It's talking about revelations in times. God will invade. It will be something so overwhelming that it will strike you either irresistible, with irresistible love, or strike you with irresistible horror. It will do that to every creature. It will be too late then to choose your side. There is no use saying that you will choose to lie down when it has become impossible to stand up. That will not be the time for choosing. It will be the time when we discover which side we have really chosen. Whether we realized it before or not, let me say that again. It will be the time when we discover which side we have chosen, whether we realized it or not. Now today, this moment is your chance to choose the right side. God is holding back to give us a chance. It will not last forever. We must take it or leave it. You see what he says there is so important. And that's the point about the law, about morality, the foundational moral laws. Again, not the not this silly today for us silly because we have the king on our side, but these ritualistic things of the old times, that was because of the hardening of our hearts. Christ has come to fulfill that. It's fulfilled, it's done, it's washed away. 
but the foundational moral laws are still for today. And when he says here, when C.S. Lewis says here, we will find out who side you're on, which you chose, whether you realize it or not, it's not just about a prayer, men. The prayer is great. Coming to Christ through that prayer is a beautiful, important, critical thing. It's so important. But it's not enough. How many of us have seen people come to Christ with a prayer? Ten years later, you find them on drugs in the street, something similar. It happens all the time. The prayer to come to Christ is step one. Now you need to pour into that person. That person needs to pour into the Word. They have to get into the Word. And if you don't do that, you might find that when the time comes, when it's impossible to stand up, that even though you said a prayer and you, you made a declaration, you were never on the side of Christ. He didn't know you. So I guess in closing, when we see the spitting of our morality in the public sphere, we need to act. We need to act just like Paul did. We do not have a free hall pass. We must act with morality. We must be gentle. We must realize that God will come back. And when he does, and he pulls out that plumb line, will you be straight and upright? You're not going to be perfect. None of us will be perfect. I am so far from that. But when we do fail, are you going to Christ in prayer? Are you going to the Father? Are you calling upon the Holy Spirit, forgive me for this sin, help me for, for the next time, and then you fail, you will fail again, and then are you going back to Christ, are you going back to God, are you calling upon the Holy Spirit, because the plumb line still exists. Christ never said the plumb line's going away, he never said that. Through faith alone you are saved, that is your salvation, but you have to act it out. We have to act just as Paul acted, boldly, in the marketplace, with our children, in the government, there is no place that we should not be acting just as Paul did. Would you join me in a word of prayer as we close? Gracious God, gracious God, thank you for the blood. Thank you for your son, that you would do that for us who are so unworthy. That you would allow for your son to be sacrificed. We know that that's enough, Lord. Thank you, thank you, thank you. But help us, we're weak. We need you. We want to be upright. Lord, we, we ask that the Holy Spirit will do this, will be in us. We know Christ. We want to know him more. We want that relationship, Lord. We call upon you. Lord, and I, I ask for you to be with these men. Let them walk out of here with vigor. You did it for Paul. He was Saul. You made him Paul. Lord, make these men Pauls. Give them a new name. Strike them with the Holy Spirit. Let them go forward and not be afraid of the gospel. Lord, you only can do this, for we are, for we are small. Speak to us, Lord in our hearts, and our minds. We'll go to the closet. We'll talk to you in the closet. Be with us, guide us, help our country, protect our children, watch over our wives. Let us be strong men, strong men like Paul. Lord, thank you, God, thank you. We pray this with the presence of the Holy Spirit and the Son, the Son's holy name, Jesus Christ, amen.